So I've come to Alderborough today, the home of Benjamin Britten and the Alderborough Festival. And uh, I'm here because I'm having a new project with uh, the ensemble Croma that I've worked with many times in the past. Um, I'm doing a new piece which is going to involve a viola de gamba, a cello and a clarinet. And uh, today they're doing a performance so that the, the three composers involved can sort of get a sense of the combination because it's obviously an unusual one. Um, and I thought it would be a good chance while I'm here to do a, a Q&A for you in interesting surroundings. So I put out a call on uh, Twitter and on my channel the other day and I uh, got some great questions. So let's have a look at them. So one of the first questions I got was from one of my patrons on Patreon. His name's Ian Lennon. And he asked me about uh, rhythms in Bach's third violin partita. And I went and had a look at the piece and I got so absorbed into it, I spent the entire day sort of analysing it and working it out and I've decided I'm going to make a whole video about that subject. So thanks for the question Ian and I will respond in the next video. Garrett Bird asks, how do quartal and quintal chords fit into functional harmony? What purpose does each one serve? This is obviously a big subject but one thing that may help you think about these kind of things is to think about symmetry. If you take the most common chords outside standard functional harmony, the major and the minor chords, you'll notice that the intervals between the notes isn't symmetrical. The major chord is sort of bottom heavy, it's got four half steps or semitones at the bottom and then three half steps on top, whereas the minor chord is the other way around, it has three half steps at the bottom and four on top. And in some sense that asymmetry gives them a grounding in the functional harmony world. We can tell when we hear them what function they have. But there are some chords that are symmetrical. A diminished chord is made of two minor triads, an augmented chord is made of two major thirds, so they're symmetrical in that the middle note is equidistant from the two outer notes. And it turns out that whenever you build a chord that's symmetrical like this, any of the notes in the chord can function as the root. And the same is true of chords built on fourths or fifths. A chord of, say, C, F, B flat might be a C7 sus4, or a B flat sus2, or an F sus4. And it's often down to the melodic line to suggest which one it actually is. I first learned about the ambiguous power of fourths in my short-lived attempts to be a jazz pianist. And I realised that in any slightly modern jazz kind of style, you can slide around on almost any chord made up of fourths, and it will sound pretty good. <laughs> Stefanos Curidis asks, Nowadays the world of music is dominated by recorded music and its online streaming. Even written notated music is, of, is more often listened to privately in a recorded form than in a live setting. Where do you stand on this with regard to your music? Do you write and notate music with its stage performance in mind or are you interested in directly recording it? And more generally, why would someone choose to be a composer and not a recording artist? Why would somebody choose to be a composer and not a recording artist? I'm laughing about this because I just finished up a new CD of my chamber music and I suddenly realised this will be my first ever David Bruce CD where it's just my music. So here I am in my late 20s and I've written all this music and it's taken me all this time to do this one thing that in most other genres of music would be practically the first thing on the list to do. So yeah, at its heart I'm thinking about live performance when I'm writing. I'm thinking about the interaction between the players and I'm imagining that kind of concentrated listening that you only get in the concert hall. People often talk down to a concert hall experience as being stuffy or that you have to sit still as people shushing you or whatever. But I do really appreciate that in the concert hall the music is centre and in full focus. Whoever said that the concert hall is a temple to art was, was right. It's a, quite a precious experience, I think. That said, like everyone else, I, I listen to most of my music through headphones. So I'm definitely relieved in a way when I get a definitive version of a piece down on a recording. As much as anything it's for PR, it's just allowing people to hear the music. But hopefully that also means that the next time there's a group in town playing some David Bruce, they'll come down and experience it live. Pedro Proenza says, what are some of your favourite living composers under 50? So I'm just going to mention two who are both good friends of mine and both write wonderful music. One is Chris Cerrone, who's a Brooklyn-based composer. 
his biggest hit to date was probably Invisible Cities, which was performed over headphones to an audience in the middle of Union Station in Los Angeles. So the singers were mingling with commuters. Chris's music is shimmering and full of string harmonics and of, often has a very simple harmonic palette, but has a highly distinctive sound world. There's a fabulous video of his piece Gold Beater's Skin on YouTube, which you should check out. I'll link it below. The other one is Eleanor Langer, who's a Russian composer based in the UK. I actually met her here years ago. Um, she's worked, like me, a lot in opera. Um, opera's a notoriously difficult art form to get right. I've, you know, you go to countless premieres where, for one reason or another, it just doesn't work. But Lena's written a number of really good operas. There was The Lion's Face and, more recently, Figaro Gets a Divorce. For an introduction to her music, check out the song cycle Landscape with Three People, which you can get on Spotify featuring the wonderful Anna Dennis, who's one of my favourite sopranos. Mikis, aka C1D, asks, Have you ever gotten any backlash or negative comments about your musical style being more accessible and tonal than most of the contemporary music? Did that affect you in any way? Well, you know, I don't think I have. I think the biggest critic has been inside my own head. As a student, I was genuinely interested in the more atonal modernist path, but the more I came to understand what I was trying to do musically, the more I felt that tonal centres were pretty essential to me. For a while it became almost a game I had to tease myself to do to sort of dare to write a major seventh arpeggio or something. It doesn't affect the way I write but I would say that I still feel a little bit uncomfortable in composing circles like at a composer's award ceremony for example because you're right that probably 80% of the new classical music written is more atonal than mine. But this is one of those things you have to find your way of dealing with in your head, Some something you just have to keep fighting. In some ways that was why I started a YouTube channel to overcome those last temptations to hide away in a corner. Well, I was quite inspired by an answer that YouTuber Casey Neistat gave, I'm sure many of you know him. Um, he was asked how he had the confidence to put all his life online the way he does. And he said something to the effect of that he lives his life by a moral code that he believes in. And as long as he can feel that to himself that he's stuck to that code, he can be confident in what he does. And I thought, you know, he's right. All you, have to, all you can do is make choices and decisions you make for reasons you've thought through and believe in. And if you do that, there shouldn't be no reason to be embarrassed or ashamed about anything. So that's what I'm trying to do. Lords22 asks, is there any point in writing music that doesn't break any new ground? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, what is new ground anymore? I mean, pretty much any extreme you can think of has already been reached. Music is about expectation, and for me the joy and the challenge in writing is to try to create the conditions where you are maybe touched or shocked or moved by the way the piece confronts or confounds your expectations. I think it's a bit of a dangerous game to get involved in to decide whether you're breaking new ground or not. I'm sure there are many composers out there who are writing you know, nothing but harsh dissonances feel like they're breaking new ground, whereas they're actually repeating ideas that have been around for a hundred years. The reverse was also true, for example, for Sibelius, as Morton Feldman pointed out. He said the people you think are radicals might really be conservatives, and the people you think are conservatives might be radical. Pieces like Sibelius's Fifth and Seventh Symphonies are now rightfully understood for the groundbreaking structures they really are, where once they were laughed at as twee and old-fashioned. Kevin asks, any tips or advice for turning a single section into a fuller piece? How to develop a B section that flows with the primary idea? This seems to be a really common question. Let's say you get a flash of inspiration and a great idea, but then your inspiration stops and you're left with one minute of music. Well, what do you do? Well, you've essentially got two choices. You can put it to one side and just start looking for something else, another burst of inspiration. Don't worry about whether it's connected to the first at all. Or two, study what you've written and find some of its essential characteristics or the things that you most like about it. And then try to mould some new ideas that have some of those same features. Perhaps just changing one aspect, say the rhythm or the harmony, but keeping the other aspects the same. You might then, if you're lucky, find that you have new ideas which actually relate to the initial one. On the whole though, I find the first of those methods more effective. The links 
often come subconsciously or they're just there as part of the way you write anyway. So it's pretty common actually that the two ideas you thought of completely independently happen to fit together and that's always a really nice feeling when that happens. Eivind Werningstad says, when composing, how do you visualise music before you've created it? In what terms do you think about the music on the big and the small scale? What sort of ideas do you get that are not actual melody, harmony or rhythm? Similarly, Hubert Grivach says, do you have any specific ways of notating a structure or an idea that you have for a piece? So for me, it does vary from piece to piece, but I think on the whole, I'm almost always initially guided by the combination of instruments I'm writing for. I've talked about this before in my Composing Hacks video. And then once the piece is underway, the larger scale of it is something I'm searching for from within what I've written. I can't really think of examples where I've known what the structure of the piece will be in advance and then filled in the gaps. For me, the overall concept and structure really only starts to emerge once quite late into the process. Some pieces I've assumed will end up as being one long piece and then I've broken them up into separate movements later on. And it's also happened the other way around. Or sometimes the whole concept for what a piece will be emerges quite late into writing it and I have to sort of go back through it and look at it again and rewrite in with that new concept in mind. And that kind of overlayering of ideas can be very effective because often you write your first idea and it feels sort of painfully mundane. And it's only once you start adding these further future layers that uh, you start developing a sort of multi-layered richness to the piece. Um, and you end up hopefully with something that you could have never have thought of initially. I'm fully aware there are quite a lot of composers who do plan out the structures of a piece in advance but I really don't quite understand how, how you do that unless you write the kind of music where as soon as you've started you know what kind of thing's going to be happening three minutes later. For me I usually find as many short initial ideas as I can and I sketch them down and then it's a more tormented process of trying to join one or more of these ideas together so that the piece can start to emerge and it's only at that stage that I can then start to try and sense the overall shape of the piece. <laughs> 